Well, th uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dean uh, Stockley, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. It's, um, it's a great privilege, and as I've said at various times to the Woodhouse family, and it's great to see uh, so many friends from that family here tonight. Uh, it's, while it's a great privilege, it's also a rather daunting one when I think of that uh, person whom I got to know really well. I learned, um, I, I've learned a great deal from various mentors over my life and, and times, uh, and for more than f uh, 50 years, Owen Woodhouse was a major mentor, and indeed he continues to be. I still think about his talents whenever I'm trying to think something through or trying to put words on a page. <coughs> he emphasised the importance of getting the question right. Uh, he emphasised the importance of getting the facts right, uh, of seeking out the relevant values, policies and principles and balancing them when, uh, when necessary. And of the ongoing assessment, he w was also very insistent that we have ongoing assessment of changes uh, in the law to see just what impact it has had. Uh, also, characteristics were clear thinking, clear writing, getting the first sentence right, uh, they, they were critical as well. And, and so too was the international and comparative material. What could we learn from elsewhere? Uh, what lessons were there to be learned from elsewhere? I think that I was having a discussion with Geoffrey Palmer about the timing of this last night in terms of who first uh, came across uh, Sir Owen. Uh, Geoffrey at that time was a graduate stu student in Chicago. Uh, and uh, when uh, Sir Owen came, partly because one of his co-commissioners had children at the University of Chicago, but also because they wanted to meet up with, Hen um, with Kelvin, who was doing work on uh, no-fault uh, motor vehicle uh, recovery. Uh, and so it's not exactly clear who, who, who of the two of us first um, met Owen. I met him uh, in the library, which some of you may recall, the Law Library at the back of Pembridge. And I see Pembridge today is surrounded, must be getting rebuilt. And, and Jack Northey introduced me to the judge, who was just starting out on his Royal Commission. And it was the first time I'd ever had a substantive discussion with a judge. Uh, he was really interested in what this young man, well I must have been getting near to 30 I think, uh, had, had, to, uh, had to say. And I think he also said it would be a good idea if people within the faculty took an interest in his Royal Commission. Now I'm sure that he did say the same thing to Colin Aikman who was then the Dean at Victoria and as I'll mention later uh, that led to a number of us appearing. Now, You've got a number of names, if you can see them on the screen behind me, and, and I'll move through a number of different topics. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about various um, places of peril and danger. They, they present themselves all the time, uh, and, and to mention some that I'm not going to discuss, consider the Korean Peninsula right at the moment, the 2004 Indian Ocean and 2011 Fukushima earthquakes and tsunami, the war, famine and cholera epidemic threatening t two million Yemenis, the storm and flooding in, in Texas, and the much more extensive flooding in Bangladesh, India and Nepal, in which it is reported that uh, 1,200 have died. Now, as I say tonight, I won't get into those matters, but it is, those are matters in which law has some part to play but inadequately at the moment. Not enough has been done in, those, in respect of those matters. But I will be considering dangers and perils at work, dangers and perils <coughs> at sea and, the and on the battlefield. Uh, and then uh, after going through those three, I'll come back to the ACC scheme uh, and its extent and its extension uh, and raise some issues at that point. Now, if <coughs> I begin in terms of timing, back in 1897, if I may. Uh, it's, it's a time when labour law was getting established in serious ways in New Zealand. Uh, it's six years after Tregear, whose name is on the, on, on the wall behind me, Edward Tregear, was appointed 
uh, as the first uh, Secretary for Labour in New Zealand and the Chief Inspector of Factories. Uh, <clears throat> another name <clears throat> that I picked from that time is Franz Kafka. This may be a bit of a surprise, but he was a brilliant young lawyer uh, and he was appointed in that year to the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute of the Kingdom of Bohemia in Prague. In that year, 1897, there's a very good lengthy article uh, in the um, Journal of the Society of Comparative Legislation by Walter Gorst Clay, barrister of the Inner Temple, and it's about the law of employers' liability and insurance against accidents. Sadly, that journal no longer um, exists. We need more comparative study of legislation. Uh, although I noticed that uh, the Chief Justice recently cited to it, but from the 1930s, I think. Now, in his very first sentence, and that again <coughs> goes back to a point I made about Sir Owen, Mr Gorst Clay sees the existing law of employer's liability as being based on two essentially distinct principles. The first uh, was compensation for a wrong, and indemnity against a peril. Compensation for a wrong, the first, had been developed by the courts, the second by legislatures. He was able to state the issue succinctly in that way because he had studied the law, and particularly the legislation, of 51 different jurisdictions. He also looked at some of the practice. He looked at the United Kingdom and many of its colonies, many of the states of the United States, uh, 15 European states, and he gave particular attention to the German law of insurance against accidents, which had been adopted in 1884 during Chancellor uh, Otto van Bismarck's long reign. That law, he considered, was probably the most successful part of social legislation undertaken in Germany at that time. In the light of that review, which just predated the first Workers' Compensation Act in the UK, and, and predated the New Zealand one by three years, 1900 was the date of ours, Gorst Clay recorded, and he's still on the first of his 111 pages, that the conviction appeared to be growing, to be gaining ground, that the law, idea of li employer's liability, the court-made law, should be abandoned altogether, and the problem of work accidents should be seen as essentially one of putting on a sound economic basis a portion of the necessary taxation of the state, that is, by legislation. He elaborated the reason uh, for uh, that uh, preference in these terms. For as the care of the injured workman and the support of those whom were he uninjured, he would have to maintain, fall in the last resort upon the state. It is the duty of the state to provide that the funds required for the discharge of this liability shall be raised in an equitable manner from among its subjects. So he was looking to sharing of, of the risk uh, and doing it in an equitable manner and he was looking to taxation, as was happening in many parts of continental Europe. A similar <coughs> appeal to community responsibility, to think of uh, the first principle in the Woodhouse report, appeared in the following year in New Zealand in the preamble to the Old Age Pensions Act of 1898. Parliament declared that it was equitable, that word again, that deserving persons who during their prime of life have helped to bear the public burden of the colony by the payment of taxes and to open up its resources by their labour and skill should receive a pension in their old age. Mr Gorst Clay's paper in its second uh, page uh, focuses on a matter which he saw as essentially separate from compensation for work injury. That matter was the precautions to be taken uh, against accidents through state regulation, supported by the enforcement of penal provisions requiring the taking of care. The legislation he reviews shows that that distinction between uh, looking after the injured on the one side or the family of the dead worker on the other was quite uh, that, that was distinct from um, the business of proper safety and regulation and enforcement. 
Even although the proposition that tort liability for negligence would help promote safe systems of work was to be heard over much of the following century, the rejection of that proposition, or at least its very limited role, had long been reflected in the imposition of distinct obligations on the operators of factories, mines, ships, shops and offices, um, many obligations to protect their workers. Consider the great efforts of Shaftesbury and Macaulay in the middle of the 19th century. That law, supported by an inspectorate and criminal liability, is to be found in New Zealand legislation dating back to at least <coughs> 1846. A publication of, um, uh, of 1896 by Edward Tregear uh, brings together that legislation and shows that, that lengthy period for, for the new colony. A publication a decade or two later to introduce an international element would have included legislation designed to give effect to the first international labour conventions adopted in 1906. They prohibited the use of white phosphorus in the match industry and night work for women employed in industry, an, an early sign that employers were willing to take on such obligations, that, who were willing to do that, wished to be protected by treaty from foreign employers, who would otherwise be free of such obligations. That argument of foreign cheating was one which Samuel Plimsoll ha had already had to deal with in getting his essential safety measure protecting seafarers established. The preambles to those uh, early treaties referred accordingly to the desire of the parties to facilitate the protection of work people by the adoption of common provisions. Now uh, I've so far mentioned several notable individuals including lawyers uh, and legislation and treaties but not the courts except uh, very incidentally. The Tregear publication like that of Gorst Clay does both include the uh, Employers Liability Acts from 1882 through to the 1890s. Those acts chipped away at the extraordinary 1837 decision of Lord Abinger and his fellow barons in Priestley and Fowler. And now it's interesting for me for a number of reasons and I trust it's of some interest to you uh, to go back to that case. By the time, in 1837, by that time, the common law judges had established that an individual was responsible for his own fault and, uh, and, and there could be as well vicarious um, uh, liability to a third person for their servant's negligent conduct in the course of that employment. <clears throat> but what of the case presented by Baron Abinger and his colleagues of physical harm caused by the negligent conduct of one servant to another. Could the master be held liable to the, in, to the injured servant? The case, said the barons, was unprecedented. We are therefore to decide the question upon general principles, and in doing so we are at liberty <coughs> to look at the consequences of a decision the one way or the other. The judgment continues with these hypotheticals, all concerned with transportation, but transportation of a particular kind. And I do it the glass. <coughs> if the master be liable to the servant in this action, they said, the principle of that liability will be found to, carrying, to carry us to an alarming extent. It's the kind of sentence that I don't think judges should be in the habit of writing. Um, he who is responsible by this general duty or by the terms of his contract for all the consequences of negligence in a matter in which he is the principal is responsible, and here's the particular type of transportation, is responsible for the negligence of his coachmaker, of his harness maker, or his coachman. The footman, therefore, who rides behind the carriage may have an action against his master for a defect in the carriage owing to the negligence of the harvest maker or for drunkenness, neglect or want of skill in the coachman, nor is there any reason why the principal should not, 
if applicable in this class of cases, extend to many others. And the court continues with suggested liabilities in, in respect of other classes of domestic servants. The chambermaid, the upholsterer, the cook, the butcher and the builder. And throughout the word used is servant, not um, employee or worker. The court essentially concluded the case against the injured servant in this case with this assessment. The inconvenience, not to say the absurdity of these consequences, afford a sufficient argument against the application of this principle to the present case. And in that largely unreasoned and unprincipled way, the common servant doctrine or fellow employment rule was established with serious consequences, getting in the way of injured uh, workers uh, in many parts of the common law world. It, it's striking that in 1939 or fully 100 years later, the House of Lords, while finding that the doctrine was based on personal apprehension rather than on principle, and that, they quote, there were none to praise and very few to love it, held that the doctrine could not be overthrown by judicial decision. It was too long established, uh, they said. And Lord Atkin was one of those judges, and it's interesting to compare what he had said just a few years earlier, um, uh, right in the middle of the Depression, in respect of the snail in the bottle in the case of Donoghue and Stevenson. Now, it's important, as Sir Owen would have insisted, to look at some of the real facts at that time. This is 1837. At that time, had they thought about ra the railways, they might have taken account of the fact that railway construction and operations uh, in, in the UK were developing rapidly. There were already about 500 miles of track and up to 900 workers who can hardly be thought of as servants serving along with other servants in, in the household. Thinking back to the various categories of servants Aben mentioned. Further as an effect and cause of railways development came big increases in mining and metallurgy and the use of the blast furnace. The rapidly developing industrial revolution with its uh, manifold dangers to the increasing numbers of industrial workers and the resulting serious injury appear to have passed the barons by. You will, I hope, um, agree with my assessment that that ruling was extraordinary both as a matter of principle and fact. Now I no now move um, uh, to a second place of peril, of danger, uh, dangers at sea. As I said at the beginning, I'll come back to work accidents, the workplace, uh, the ACC scheme and its uh, scope. Edward Tregear included among his collection of labour legislation that which gave particular protections to seafarers. For at least six centuries, national legislation or national practice had required masters of ships to go to the aid of those in distress at sea. That obligation took general treaty form only in 1910 and it was included in New Zealand shipping legislation a few years later. It's, the legislation said a master or person in charge of a ship shall, so far as he can do so, without serious danger to his own ship, her crew and passengers, render assistance to every person, even uh, subjects of foreign states at war with His Majesty, who is found at sea in danger of being lost. Uh, and if he fails to do that, he commits a crime. Now that um, obligation has been accompanied by a quid pro quo since at least 1566. In that year, Pope Pius V, in calling on fishing vessels to come to the aid of those in peril, provided the balance. Payment should be made to those who took that action. Now, some law and economics scholars in addressing this area of law failed to mention the legislation and the treaties. It seems they're not interested in the written law. They put the matter essentially in, in economic terms, in terms of economic incentives. But surely, as a great French law of the sea expert has put it, the ideas of humanity at the base of the 1910 Convention are above all, dis all discussion. The obligation of assistance is demanded by humanity, a word that 
will occur quite often uh, in, in this address. It's a word that Owen often used in thinking and writing about uh, injury prevention, rehabilitation and compensation. That humanitarian demand appears to be often ignored who think solely in terms of the market uh, and zero-sum games. Think of all the actions of good citizenship being displayed right at the moment in Houston and no doubt in uh, Bangladesh and so on, where so many are in peril, uh, if not at sea, certainly in very deep water, uh, and, and who I imagine are not contemplating that there will be a quid pro quo. They're doing just their humanitarian duty. Now I come to my third area, though in addition, an obligation of assistance to those in, in distress on the battlefield. In 1859, at Solferino, Henri Dunant, a, a Swiss citizen who was hoping to get Napoleon to assist him in financing a development in Algeria, uh, Henri Dunant, finding this massive uh, casualty uh, rate uh, after that awful battle, uh, arranged instead, not, not a loan from the emperor, but uh, he arranged succour to the casualties in their many thousands. He proceeded on the basis of tutti fratelli, uh, we are all brothers. No line was to be drawn between friend and foe. His efforts um, led, <coughs> along with efforts of others of his compatriots, to the formation in 1863 of what became the International Committee of the Red Cross and the adoption in 1864 of the first Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the sick and wounded in the field. It provided for the protection as neutral of hospitals and ambulances and of those who work there. It also protected houses which were taking care of the wounded. Further, the generals were to issue an appeal to the inhabitants to their humanity to help, to bring help to the wounded. Those who did so will, were to remain free. It will not surprise you that the very first of the fundamental principles of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent movement is humanity, and that the law of arms or the law of war or the law of armed conflict is now commonly referred to as international humanitarian law. Now, Another name that I have from the 1860s uh, is Florence Nightingale. She was flatly opposed to Dunant's ideas of having uh, National Red Cross societies. She saw their responsibilities, or the responsibilities suggested for them, uh, as belonging to governments alone. Governments should not be able to get rid of those um, obligations by having these voluntary organisations. She failed in that opposition, as is demonstrated by the fact that there are now nearly 190 uh, National Red Cross societies around the world, National Red Crescent societies. But she was much more successful, and this is a much more important part of her contribution, she was much more successful in insisting on accurate statistics. She collected the facts about military deaths, and she was able to show by looking at them that it was more dangerous to be in the barracks in the British Army than it was to be in the battlefield in the Crimea. She demonstrated this very effectively and vis visually by using pie charts, one of the first um, people to use pie charts. Uh, <clears throat> and, and those charts were not just descriptive, they were also prescriptive. She was in the business of persuading the government to improve military hygiene. She took on the army top brass and was successful in that uh, endeavour. Just a week ago, the Australian chief government scientist declared that she should, she should be known not as the lady with the lamp. I have it on good authority that she was not a very good nurse. Uh, but she should be known as the lady with the logarithm or the patron, patron saint of mathematicians. That government, chief government scientist drew several lessons from her life. The first was that mathematics was critical to our lives and societies, and, and the last was that evidence was to be used 
to make a difference, instancing health care policy. Florence Nightingale <coughs> corresponded with a great number of people, including Sir George Grey, and part of the correspondence is about lessons to be drawn from the first New Zealand census. Again, she suggested how, in New Zealand, hygiene among Maori populations might be improved. In one of her letters to Grey, she said, you will do a noble work in New Zealand. I think it was about the time he was coming back from Cape Colony to New Zealand. You will do a noble work in New Zealand, but pray, think of your statistics. And <laughs> the word statistics began with a capital S. Now, in 19, again in 1863 came uh, the first detailed statement of the law laws of war. It has at its core humanity competing with military necessity. It is General Orders 100, uh, issued by President Lincoln for the armies of the North in that very destructive civil war. Francis Lieber pre prepared that text. Uh, he was a real polymath. He also had sons on both sides of the battle. Uh, and, and he spelled out a very detailed text, including a ban on waterboarding. It's not something that's new, that ban. Uh, at the same time, well, the following year, 1864, uh, there were principles stated in much shorter form for the battle um, at, 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 in, at Gate Pa. They were stated on the Maori side by Henare Taratoa, uh, and in which, in that, in that battle, there were 250 Ngaitarangi warriors, uh, and they defeated a British force of almost 2,000. Those laws provided that unarmed soldiers were to be saved, as were the wounded or captured, and soldiers who flee to the house of a priest. Unarmed Pākehā women and children were also to be spared. Now, that body of law has been greatly elaborated over the following 150 years, and it's been extended beyond the field uh, to, the sh to the shipwrecked and uh, people at sea in difficulty. Um, to prisoners of war in 1929 and in 1949, a date which is significant, to civilians in occupied territory. Further changes were made in the 1970s to develop the law in respect of internal armed conflict, methods and means of warfare which had not been addressed uh, since 1907, and improved methods of implementation. Now, one of the principles that has been carried forward all the way since 1899, and it's included in one of those 1977 texts, uh, is what is known as the de Martins formula, a formula drafted by Frederick de Martins, who was a leading Russian, or some would say Estonian, international lawyer and one of the principal negotiators in, in The Hague in 1899 and 1907. The latest version says, in cases not covered by this protocol or other international agreements, civilians and combatants uh, remain under the protection and authority of the principles of international law derived from established custom, from the principles of humanity and from the dictates of the public conscience. Uh, in 1996, the International Court of Justice uh, spoke, uh, su spoke very strongly in support of that clause. They said, that court said the continuing existence and applicability of that clause was not to be doubted. And it was an affirmation that the principles and rules of humanitarian law apply to nuclear weapons. In saying that, the court rejected um, the arguments made by the Russian Federation and the United States, among others. Now, there are obviously terrible breaches of this body of law, um, and a good deal of no cases of successful application which don't get the same press. I just want to touch on one matter which has been prominent uh, recently, and I'll do this quickly. It's a matter that, uh, about which there's been a good deal of controversy. It relates to the resolution adopted late last year uh, by the Security Council uh, relating to the Middle East. It was adopted on 23 December last year, in the last days of New Zealand's membership of the Security Council. Uh, New Zealand, the New Zealand action in co-sponsoring it and voting for it uh, has uh, been criticised. 
Now, uh, and, and has been the subject of much ill-informed comment, including by the recently appointed um, Foreign Minister uh, in his first few days back in May. Now, uh, New Zealand um, w voted in favour along with 13 other members including France, Japan, Spain and the United Kingdom uh, and the United States, as is well known, abstained. Now I make four points about it very briefly. The resolution first reaffirmed that the occupied Palestinian territories were subject to the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949 concerning the protection of civilians in armed conflict. And that convention includes a prohibition on civilian settlements uh, in occupied territory. Second, that position of prohibition on civilian settlements had been taken by the legal advisor to the Israeli Foreign Ministry as long ago as November 1967, just a few months after the June War. And it was taken unanimously by the International Court of Justice in 2004. Third, to counter the argument that uh, the resolution was unbalanced, that the resolution condemned all acts of violence against civilians, called for immediate steps to end them, and called upon the parties to act on the basis of international law. My final point about that um, event, about that resolution, is that the Fourth Convention was actually in draft before World War II. It was to be the subject of a diplomatic conference in 1940. Not very good timing. The ICRC commentary to that convention says this about the delay. Uh, and it's very cautious ICRC writing as uh, they're, they're renowned for that caution. The events of World War II, they say, show the disastrous consequences of the absence of a convention for the protection of victims in warfare. So a strong, a strong statement, um, the disastrous consequences of which uh, we're all pretty well aware. Now let me um, come back to the business of work injuries and, and beyond. I, I go back again <clears throat> to the late 19th century and partly um, as a link to the reference on the uh, overhead behind me uh, to the International Labour Organisation. The bodies that <coughs> were set up in uh, continental Europe, the one that Franz Kafka was involved with for instance, had very interesting functions and composition. The German associations and those in Austria were formed by groups of employers within a particular industry. Their boards had equal numbers of employer and worker delegates. They had large powers of self-management uh, and they had two different functions, as you might have guessed. They first of all were involved in setting and gathering the premiums from the employers and making decisions on compensation for work injuries and deaths on a no-fault basis. And second, they had the role of proposing regulations to promote safety in the particular industry. They had the function of appointing inspectors and the function of enforcing the regulations against employers and workers in the event of breach. The exercise of these important powers was subject to supervision and appellate control by, common, by government insurance officers. Kafka, to come back to him, was a very senior member of such an office in Prague, the capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia, which was then known as the Manchester of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's a great recent book about Kafka in which his office writings have been translated with some really interesting commentary. And you find him dealing with businesses which were trying to get into a less expensive risk category. Uh, you find him resolving particular compensation claims on, on appeal. Uh, you find him trying to improve safety standards, for instance in quarries. Some of you may remember how Joseph Kay came to his death uh, by being stabbed um, uh, at, uh, at, in, in a quarry. Uh, 
in, in the trial. And after 1914, he was becoming increasingly concerned as well with the rehabilitation of the many servicemen uh, wounded in the Great War and the establishment of psychiatric hospitals for them. It's slightly macabre to notice that one of the psychiatric hospitals was proposed, proposed for the town of Frankenstein. <laughs> now, the composition of these associations can be linked, I think, uh, to what happened when the International Labour Organisation was established in 1919 at Versailles. <clears throat> the Treaty of Versailles doesn't have a very good name, but the International Labour Organisation was one of its major products. That constitution provides for a tripartite um, representation. Each of the now 187 members of the International Labour Organisation is represented at the conference which adopts international labour conventions, now to almost 200 of them. Uh, th those delegations uh, have two government delegates, one employer delegate and one worker delegate. And, and the governing body, the executive body, uh, is similarly composed. Those responsible for the preparation of the um, that chapter of the Treaty of Versailles and for the setting up of the organisation justified it in this way. Universal and lasting peace can be established only if it is based upon social justice and conditions of labour uh, at, at that stage exist involving such injustice, hardship and privation to large numbers of people so as to produce unrest so great that the peace and harmony of the world are imperiled and an improvement of these conditions is urgently required. No doubt they had very clearly in mind what had happened in Russia just less than two years earlier uh, and what was happening in terms of social and economic turmoil across uh, the whole of Europe. They, the drafters set out a non-exhaustive list of areas in which improvements might were required, they also so set out general principles. And one of these principles, it's really striking to read when you think it's nearly a hundred years ago, one of these principles was that men and women should receive equal remuneration for work of equal value. So, you know, there, there you have that proposition stated way back then. And we're still, even in New Zealand, a long way from achieving that. They also, as with the, early, the two earlier uh, labour conventions I mentioned, made the point that there had to be international regulation of labour conditions because the failure of any nation to adopt humane conditions of labour is an obstacle in the way of other nations which desire to improve the conditions in their own countries. If, if the Dutch were to uh, prohibit uh, the use of children in mines they might be worried that the Belgians would get ahead of them, but if they were all bound by the same treaty obligation, that wouldn't happen. Now, those principles uh, developed, and that mechanism developed, uh, was reassessed in 1944. It's interesting to see these things happening in the middle of warfare. Uh, in Philadelphia, when the International Labour Conference met uh, with President Roosevelt uh, in attendance, and, and the conference was under the chairmanship of Walter Nash. The only other New Zealand um, minister who has chaired the International Labour Conference is Jim Bolger. Uh, so two con significant contributions, and they set out the fundamental principles, uh, which include the proposition that labour is not a commodity, an idea that was challenged really by the very use of the word contracts in the Employment Contracts Act. Um, it's labour is not a commodity and there are various other important principles stated there. And, and you can relate them back to um, Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, the Atlantic Charter and Declaration of 1942. Uh, and, and, and also, um, if you want more detail, uh, go to William Beveridge's report in uh, 1942 leading to major uh, social reform in the United Kingdom. Uh, Beveridge um, had, as, as part of his first principle, the proposition that a revolutionary moment in the world, world's history is a time for revolutions, not for patching. 
A revolutionary moment in the world's history is a time for revolutions, not for patching. Now the International Labour Organisation under the enthusiastic leadership of Albert Thomas, uh, its first director, adopted a great number of conventions. New Zealand had no interest at all in the ILO, just as it had almost no interest in the League of Nations until 1935 and the election of the first Labour government. In 1938, uh, New Zealand became party to 21 international labour conventions, including three relating to workers' compensation. Now, in terms of workers' compensation, I should, should go back to 1900 or slightly earlier, uh, 1900, the year when uh, Workers' Compensation Act was passed for the first time. And just before that uh, was the disaster in the Brunner mine in 1896. That killed all 65 mem miners working there. They left 39 widows and 192 children, as well as uh, elderly uh, dependents. I'm grateful to Hazel Armstrong for some of this material, I should say. The funds available from a government-imposed levy on coal production and from the friendly societies formed through the miners' unions, unions were not adequate to cover the costs of such tragedies. And the 1900 Act uh, was passed uh, in substantial part as a consequence. Now, a great deal has been written about um, the periods from 1900 on to New in New Zealand, uh, and I'm not going to add to it tonight. Uh, and indeed, time is uh, passing. Uh, but there have been all there were all these debates up to the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, they're written up very well by a great number of people, including Hazel's, as I just Hazel's writing, as I just said. Also, a very good book by Ian Campbell, who was a long-time senior member of the Workers' Compensation Board staff, and, and by Geoffrey Palmer. And and I would expect that in future lectures in the, in the series and in the associated symposiums, uh, some of that experience will be reviewed in a wider context as Sir Owen would have wished. But if I could just go back again to the reference I made earlier to Owen talking to Colin Aikman, and, and this does go to the point about close relationships within our society between the universities and, and many others. Uh, Colin reported to us at morning tea one day that he'd had this conversation with the judge and wouldn't it be a good idea uh, to, for us to make submissions. And four of us did. Uh, Colin, uh, Ivor Richardson, uh, Peter McKenzie and I. And, and it was great last night to have Peter in the audience and for him to correct one or two of the things I'd said. Um, <laughs> now, apart from the Social Wel Welfare Department, that group of four was the only group the only submission, only set of submissions, arguing for a universal scheme. Colin made a good argument that the final phrase routinely put into Royal Commission um, ref terms of reference was wide enough for the Commission to go widely, as, as of course it did. Now, in terms of my own thinking, and I, we talked about this, a number of us, in, at a 2003 conference, I, I was influenced um, by the teaching and legal system, uh, which began with Priestley and Fowler. Uh, I, I was aware of the inadequate and chancy uh, law, um, common law and legislative remedies, a matter which had been emphasised by Terence Eisen's recent book, The Forensic Lottery, influenced by the preamble to the Social Security Act of 1938, and, and so on. Uh, also influenced by the ILO conventions, in respect of which New Zealand was in breach because of the six-year time limit um, for compensation in New Zealand. Also, the beverage report was important in my thinking. Now, I'd just take three um, lessons from the last 50 years of debate since the report was published. The first concerns the questions to be asked and answered. Uh, the 1967 report, like the 1897 article, uh, distinguished prevention of injury uh, from rehabilitation and compensation. Next, um, incapacity, in terms of widening the question, incapacity should not be limited 
to injuries at work, nor indeed to workers. The, inf the position that was taken by Parliament after the change of government in 1972. Uh, in principle, the scheme should include incapacity for could include should include incapacity caused by illness, a subject which which was the sub subject of study, including careful costings, submissions and proposals in the law commission made by the law commission in the late <coughs> 1980s. But unfortunately, that step has yet to be be taken. Principle just cannot justify the distinction that is drawn between the entitlements of those who lose their leg in a car accident and those who lose their leg to cancer. And it's encouraging that that matter is still being, is back on the agenda and being pursued. So one uh, issue is trying to work out the right questions and just seeing how a principle applies once you take, in that case, a wider view. The second lesson yet again is about taking the fact seriously. That's the subtitle of an excellent 1996 book by three Canadian scholars, one of whom is also a New Zealander. Uh, they reviewed the evidence largely from North America of the efficiency of the tort system and its alternatives relating to automobile accidents, medical accidents, product related accidents, environmental injury and workplace injuries. They said they wished to move away from the theoretical um, debates about the appropriate normative goals of the tort system and the doctrinal implications that each entails. The tort system, they conclude, cannot successfully achieve all three of their go the goals they identified, deterrence, compensation and corrective justice. The empirical evidence leads them to a bleak judgment, that's their words, about the tort system as a compensatory mechanism. Now that, that conclusion had of course already been reached by the Royal Commission in 1967 uh, and by the Law Commission in 1988. Uh, we were greatly helped to take the 1988 exercise by many submissions, 1698, uh, and by the work of expert consultants showing the great value of, of interdisciplinary work. We had Ian Campbell, who, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, who completed an excellent PhD and published a book on the whole matter in his late 70s, a lesson to many of us perhaps. Um, so we had Ian, uh, we had uh, Professor Les Castle on underlying economic and public policy principles. He ticked me off for not knowing about Adam Smith's writing on jurisprudence. I th thought I was really a not very lettered lawyer. Um, and very good help too from two um, Australians who came to Sir Owen's funeral, uh, Richard Cumston and Richard Madden. Uh, good advice on actuarial and policy matters and rehabilitation. I just mention um, two other facts uh, which are comparative, or two other questions. The first one is about the proportion of GDP that the scheme absorbs. It's still under 2%, um, a proportion which over the years has been a good deal less than the proportion of Australia's GDP absorbed by workers' compensation and road traffic injury premiums, which of course have a much narrower coverage. And, and second, how do the administrative costs of operating the scheme compare with those of other schemes? Usually under 10% of, uh, of, of, of the premium and related income in any particular year compared with 30% or so in other systems. A third matter um, concerns the, the need for bipartisan support and for the fostering of that support. Over the years there's been far too much political bickering so far as I can observe, with insufficient attention being given to the facts and to the underlying policies and principles. I trust that I'm not being too optimistic and drawing positive lessons from the very brief life of the privatisation of injury insurance in the early 1990s and the failure of the incoming government in 2008 to give effect to the policy it had announced the previous year in opposition of re-establishing a competitive market to provide accident insurance. 
PricewaterhouseCoopers had undertaken an independent review in 2008 uh, and it concluded that the current highly regarded ACC scheme is consistent with the Woodhouse principles, adds considerable value to the New Zealand society and compares very well in comparison uh, to alternative schemes in operation internationally. So there uh, you have a, an independent report calling attention to the facts and to the principles and maybe that helped <coughs> introduce reason and an appreciation of the facts uh, for, for the incoming government. Now I come <coughs> finally um, uh, to a, a conclusion of some sen in some senses. I trust, <coughs> and I should try to get this right, I trust that I've given you a sense of, the, of some of the lessons that uh, Sir Owen in his person and in his work has taught to this um, country's great advantage. He drew on the wisdom of the ages. He drew on strong values, on wide experience, on facts, and was a great New Zealander. <coughs> I, I end with, um, not, not with the quote from Shakespeare that you have on your invitation. Um, it challenged me too much to try to work out quite how I could use it, but you might go and look at it. It's Hotspur, the young Percy, and Henry IV, part one, um, trying to persuade a reluctant uh, lord uh, <clears throat> of the importance of getting involved in the rebellion against uh, Richard II which led to his downfall and the installation of Henry IV. But I, I end with one great friend of um, Owen's, um, one of his naval colleagues, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Dennis Glover, DSC. Uh, and, and there are words that at one point I tried, um, but I didn't expect any great success, uh, to have included in the judgment uh, of the New Zealand Court of Appeal. <clears throat> this is what Dennis Glover said, I do not dream of Sussex Downs or quaint old England's quaint old towns. I think of what will yet be seen in Johnsonville and Geraldine. <laughs> Thank you.